It was two weeks ago, right here on this spot, that we as a church commissioned Brian and Jen Knapp and their daughters, Sahara, Ayantu, and Julie. We commissioned them for service, service for God in Uganda. The Knapps are going to be going to Uganda to work with orphans, to set up initiatives of microfinance to help widows provide for themselves and their families. They're also going to be setting up various discipleship training classes, all the while in Uganda, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ in word and deed. And it was two weeks ago that right on this spot, the elders of this church and family and friends and prayer support groups and all of us prayed for Jen and Brian and their girls. We prayed that God would be with them, that God would watch over them, and that God would bless the work that they're doing in Uganda, proclaiming the name of Jesus Christ. And it was right here where we prayed for them. And it was incredibly moving to watch their move in obedience, answering the call and moving forward in the assignment that God had given them. The assignment for their whole family to leave Grand Rapids and go to Uganda, Africa. Well, this past Wednesday, four days ago, Brian and Jen, Sahara, Ayantu, and Julie got on a plane and left Grand Rapids for Uganda. They left the comfort and relative safety of West Michigan for the often dangerous and tumultuous Uganda. They left this church in the community and the fellowship for an unknown church, for a new church. They left their family and friends with the hope that God would provide them new friends. They left a comfortable, nice home for a home that's not so nice and not so comfortable. They left secure jobs to raise money to raise support so that they can serve in Uganda. With serious medical conditions, they left excellent medical care here in West Michigan for medical care in Uganda that's marginal at best. They even left their dog. <laughs> that's the assignment that God has given to the Knapp family to leave the first world to go to the third world, to leave Grand Rapids to go to Uganda. That's the assignment that God gave to the Naps, essentially picking up and leaving almost everything. For the last few weeks, we've been in the book of Joshua, and we've been learning what God has been saying to Joshua and what God has to say to you and to me. And one of the first things we learned and the first things we saw in the book of Joshua is that God, right off the bat, gives Joshua an assignment. God gives Joshua the assignment to take the people of Israel into the promised land. And he says to Joshua, you're going to lead all these people and you're going to take them into the promised land and you are going to conquer Canaan. You're going to take this land and that is the land you are going to live in. That's the assignment that God gives Joshua. And he tells Joshua that if you do this, if you obey me, I'm going to bless you. If you act in obedience, I'm going to show up and I'm going to bless you and I'm going to do more than you could ever ask for or imagine in your, lives and in, the, in your life and in the people's lives around you. And not only if you obey am I going to show up, but I'm going to take you from being an aid to be the servant of the Lord. God promises Joshua that he is going to show up and that he is going to bless his obedience when he moves in the assignment that God has called him to. And because we do everything that's written in the Scripture and we try to live out these stories that we read in the Scripture, just like Joshua, each one of us has been given an assignment by God. Each one of you has an assignment that God has given to you to accomplish for him. But when I think about the NAPS assignment, 
I think that is one tough assignment. That is one extremely difficult assignment. Leaving almost everything you know and have to go across an ocean to serve God in Uganda. And I think to myself, man, it would be a lot easier serving in a soup kitchen one night a month. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? That seems to be the more doable assignment. But that's not the assignment God called the Naps to. He called them to leave West Michigan and to go to Uganda. An incredibly difficult assignment. But then, I think about your assignment. The difficult assignment that God has given to you. And it's not so different than the Naps assignment. Because there are many difficult assignments represented in this room. Many difficult assignments represented in this room. You may be called, you may have been called, to parent a child with special needs. To parent a child. You may have been called to deal with mental illness. You may have been called to fight a debilitating, chronic disease. You may be in the midst of a divorce that you didn't ask for and you don't want. God may have asked you to start at a new school and represent him at that new school. He may have put you on a team where most of the people don't know Jesus. It may be a hockey team. It may be a basketball team. It may be a lacrosse team. And the people, the boys, the girls, the men, the women that are on those, they don't know Jesus, and God put you there. He may be asking you to start a neighborhood Bible study, and you think, man, I don't know if I can do that. You may be dealing with the death of a loved one. All of these assignments and many, many, many more represented in this room are incredibly difficult assignments. Incredibly hard. And somewhere in our minds, somewhere in our minds, we know that if we're obedient to the assignment, God will bless us. Somewhere in our minds, we know that if we're obedient to the assignment, God will bless us and God will move us from being just an aid to a servant of the Lord. We know that God gave us the assignment. We know that God is responsible for the outcome of the assignment. We know that God is with us and he will never leave us nor forsake us. We know these things in our mind. But let's be honest. Just because we know these things in our mind doesn't always mean we feel these things in our hearts. And God understands that oftentimes we don't feel these things in our hearts. That the assignment that we have can be overwhelming. Not only incredibly difficult, but overwhelming. The assignment can cause anxiety. The assignment can cause worry. The assignment can cause us to be scared. The assignment can even cause panic and anger. Have you ever thought to yourself or said to somebody else, hey, I didn't sign up for this assignment. I don't want the assignment. And I don't, if I'm completely honest with you, I don't even think I can accomplish the task. I'm not able to do the assignment. And that often leads us to feel the discouragement, the fear, the anxiety, the worry, the panic, and the anger. But God doesn't want to leave you stuck in the discouragement and the anger and the fear and the anxiety and the worry. God doesn't want to leave you there. He wants to move you from discouragement, anxiety, fear, and worry to a place where you recognize that he has given you the assignment, where you know and you feel in your heart that he has given you the assignment, where you know and you feel in your heart that he is responsible for the outcome, where you know and you feel in your heart that he will never leave you or forsake you, where you know and you feel in your heart that if you are obedient, he will definitely 
bless you. He wants you to know and to feel that in the depths of your soul. So how does he do it? How does he help you to know and to feel all of those things? Well, one of the ways he does it is he brings people into your life to tell you that you can do it. He brings people into your life to tell you, you got this. The assignment that God has given you, you are up for the task. You can complete the assignment that God has given you. He brings people into your life to build you up. He brings people into your life to make you strong. He brings people into your life to provide you with encouragement. He brings people into your life to give you courage. That is exactly what he did for Joshua. Take your Bibles and turn to Joshua chapter 1. Turn to Joshua chapter 1. It's found on page 169 in the Bible that the church provides. It's either under your seat or in the pew rack in front of you. I'd love for you to follow along with me this morning. In Joshua chapter 1, we're introduced to Joshua. And Joshua has been given an assignment by God. And the assignment that Joshua has been given is not an easy assignment. This is a very, very, very difficult assignment. So let's look together at the first few verses of Joshua chapter 1 because it helps us understand the assignment that Joshua has been given. Verse 1, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses is aid. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am about to give them to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. In these first two verses of chapter 1, we learn that Moses is dead. God's great servant is dead. The man who God declared the great deliverer of his people is dead. He had led the people of Israel out of slavery in Egypt. For 400 years, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the people of Israel, for 400 years were in captivity in Egypt. They're in slavery in Egypt. And God brings this great deliverer, Moses, to bring and lead these people out of Egypt. And he does just that. He leads them out of Egypt. And after about three weeks out of slavery and out of Egypt, the people of Israel come upon this land that God has promised Abraham. And they're standing at the edge of the land. And you'll recall the story, Moses sends Joshua, Caleb, and ten other spies into the land to check out the land of Canaan. The twelve spies come back, and only two of the spies vote to go in. Ten of them say, we can't handle the people of Canaan. We'll be destroyed. So because of the people's disobedience, because of the people's disobedience and Moses' disobedience, the people of Israel wander in the desert wilderness for 40 years. For 40 years, the people of Israel go round and round and round in circles in order that God teaches them how they are going to be able to take this promised land. And this is not an easy assignment, but this is the assignment that God has given to Joshua. Joshua. I am going to have you lead the people of Israel into the promised land. Now think about this for a moment. Stop and think about what Joshua might be thinking at this point. Moses, the man who has led the people of Israel out of slavery, the man who has led the people of Israel for 40 years in this wilderness, the man who was the designated deliverer that God had ordained. He's made all the decisions. He's been the one that has talked and spoken directly with God. Now, Joshua's there. 
Joshua has observed all this, but it's been all in Moses' hands. And now Moses is dead. And God says to Joshua, you are going to take my people into that promised land. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm in Joshua's shoes, I'm a little bit overwhelmed with the assignment. I'm thinking to myself, this is a pretty difficult assignment, and I'm probably thinking I'd rather be serving soup in a soup kitchen. Not sure I'm going to be able to lead these people into this promised land. Not sure I'm going to be able to accomplish the task that God has called me to accomplish. And Joshua, at this point, is probably feeling overwhelmed because this is a difficult assignment. It is not easy taking the land of Canaan. This is a difficult task. Taking a huge piece of land from a lot of people who do not want to give the land up. They like their land. They want to keep their land. There's a reason the first time 10 spies came back and said, hey, we don't need to go into that land. That's because Canaan is a fairly developed culture and people groups. These are peoples that are advanced for the time. Now, essentially, Canaan is a region of land. It's a region of land that's under nominal control by Egypt. If you think of Egypt during the time, Egypt is essentially the superpower that controls the whole region. Canaan is one of the regions that Egypt kind of controls. But Canaan is not just one government. Canaan is is, is a region that is made up of multiple city-states. So there's just not one government that Joshua and the people of Israel need to conquer. When the people of Israel go into Canaan, they have to conquer multiple defended, well-armed, fortified individual city-states that each had their own king. So Joshua just doesn't have to conquer one army, one city. He has to conquer multiple armies and multiple cities. This is a difficult task that Joshua has been given. This is a tough assignment that Joshua has been given. And God says to Joshua, you are going to be the one who leads my people into this promised land. And I have to believe that Joshua is feeling overwhelmed, fearful, anxious, worried, maybe all out afraid, and maybe even a little angry that God has given him this assignment. Because probably deep down inside, he's not sure he can get it done. And you know that feeling, don't you? The assignment that God has given you. You think about the assignment God has given you and you think to yourself, I don't know. I don't know if I can do this. I didn't sign up for this. I don't know how I'm going to deal with the death of my husband. I don't know how I'm going to show my child what Jesus looks like because they're so trapped in sin. I don't know if I'm going to be able to succeed at this new school. I don't know if I will be able to start a neighborhood Bible study. You know that feeling inside that sense of being overwhelmed, that anxiousness, that fear that comes in and you begin to wonder, will I be able to accomplish the task that God has given me? Here's the good news. God does not leave you in that worry, in that fear, and in that anxiety. He didn't leave Joshua there, and he's not going to leave you there. God does two things for Joshua and for us. First, God himself provides encouragement to Joshua. Look at what he says. We've seen this in the past few weeks. Look at what God says to Joshua in verse 5. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. God tells Joshua, I've given you this assignment, I'm responsible for the outcome, and I will never leave you nor forsake you. Look what he says again in verse 9, look what he says. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. God 
promises to be with Joshua. God commands Joshua to be strong and courageous in his assignment. And just as God speaks to Joshua, God speaks to you and God speaks to me. And he promises that he will never leave us nor forsake us. And he commands you and he commands me to be strong and to be courageous. So the first thing that God does is he encourages us. The second thing that God does is something that I don't think we always see from this story. The second thing that God does is he brings people into Joshua's life to provide him encouragement. He brings people into Joshua's life to say to Joshua, you got this. You can accomplish the assignment and the task that God has given to you. We got you. We're with you. And we are going to stand alongside of you. Remember the three tribes that Jim talked about last week? The tribes of Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh? God brings them into the picture to provide encouragement to Joshua. Remember, they're the tribes that God had given land to on the east side of the Jordan River. Remember, the people of Israel are wandering in the desert. They come to the east side of the Jordan River. The three tribes, Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh say, hey, this is pretty nice land. We think we want to stay here. So Moses says to them, okay, you can stay there on the condition that you work and fight with the rest of Israel in conquering the land of Canaan. The people of Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh agree to the deal. They take the land on the east side of the Jordan River, and then they encourage Joshua and Moses by agreeing to fight. Look, we saw that if you turn the page in the church Bible. Remember, in beginning in verse 12, Joshua reminds these tribes of their promise to help the rest of Israel find its rest. And the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh step up and answer the call. But I want to look at how they answer the call, specifically what they say to Joshua. How is it that they encourage him? So look at what they say after they, in response to Joshua's reminder. Verse 16. Verse 16. Then they answered Joshua, whatever you have commanded us, we will do, and wherever you send us, we will go. Just as we fully obeyed Moses, so we will obey you. Only may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Whoever rebels against your word and does not obey it, whatever you may command them will be put to death. Only be strong and courageous. Now there is an encouraging response. They know the assignment that Joshua has been giving. They've been listening to Joshua's commands for preparation. And the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh respond enthusiastically with encouragement to Joshua's charge. And essentially, they provide four means of encouragement to Joshua. So I'd like to point those out for you this morning. The four means of encouragement that the tribes give to Joshua. The first thing they do to encourage Joshua is found in verses 16 and 17. The first thing they do is to ensure Joshua of their complete allegiance in willingness to help. They assure Joshua of their complete allegiance and willingness to help. Look at beginning in 16. Then they answer Joshua, whatever you have commanded us we will do and wherever you send us we will go. Just as we fully obeyed Moses, so we will obey you. The tribes are promising to help Joshua in the assignment. They have no personal agendas. They ask for no concessions to benefit them personally. They step up to the task. They know the assignment is difficult. They know this is an assignment that Joshua created on his own. They know that God gave the assignment to Joshua. Look at what they say. They know that wherever they go is in God's plan. In a novel written by George MacDonald, one of the characters says this, I find the doing of the will of God leaves me no time for disputing about his plan. I find that doing the will of God leaves me no time for disputing about his plan. That is the attitude of the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. There's no dispute. They don't ask for any changes to the assignment. They don't try to change the assignment. They don't lessen the assignment. They don't kick back and sit on their tails and do nothing. They don't delay. They step up and they encourage Joshua with their allegiance and 
their willingness to act and move with him. The first way that the tribes encourage Joshua is to align themselves with him and declare their willingness to help. Second, the people encourage Joshua by praying for him. Look at verse 17. Only may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Only may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. This is a statement of prayer by the people. The people are praying, God, be with Joshua. God, Joshua needs you. God, in order for Joshua to be successful in this assignment, in this task, he needs you to show up. So the people tell Joshua, we are praying for you, and then the people pray for him. They recognize that without prayer, the assignment, no matter what the assignment is, is not going to be successful. So they step up and declare themselves to be people of prayer. In Corey Ten Boom's writing, she wrote this in one of her writings, is prayer your steering wheel or your spare tire? Is prayer your steering wheel or your spare tire? You see, in our lives, so often we use prayer when we get stuck or when we get lost. And what Corey, the point she's trying to make here is prayer needs to be an essential, integral part of your life. Look at Joshua. At this point in time, Joshua is 80 years old. He has all the experience in the world. He has been groomed for this task. He has the experience. He's been groomed for the task. He knows what he is to do. But he also knows that without prayer, there is going to be no success in the assignment. Without God's intimate personal involvement, there will be no success in the assignment. And it is the same for us, no matter what your assignment, at home, in this church, at your job, at your school, no matter where your assignment is, no matter what your assignment is, no matter your experience, no matter the background that you have, you will not be successful unless you pray. And these tribes recognize that and they tell Joshua that they are going to pray for him. And that provides Joshua with encouragement to move forward in the task. The third thing that the people do to encourage Joshua found in the first part of verse 18 is to take Joshua's assignment and response in their responsibility with life and death seriousness. The tribes take Joshua's assignment and their responsibility to the assignment with life and death seriousness. Look at verse 18. Whoever rebels against your word and does not obey it, whatever you may command them, will be put to death. That is life and death seriousness. In Joshua 7, we're going to meet a man by the name of Achan. And Achan did not take God's command seriously. And as a result, he was executed. The tribes of Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh understand the serious nature of the assignment that God has given to Joshua. They recognize that this assignment is a matter of life and death, and their seriousness is an encouragement to Joshua. If we today, if we today right here took our obedience as a matter of life and death, if we intensely follow Jesus in this matter with the seriousness of life and death, do you realize the impact that it would have on our lives? Do you realize the impact that it would have on the ministries that we're involved in? Would you realize the impact it would have on the people around us if we all took our assignments with life and death seriousness? And think about the people you come in contact with, the people that you know their assignments Lord, forgive me for not encouraging them with life and death seriousness about the assignment that you've given to them. Because each of us have an opportunity to touch the people that come in contact with us and encourage them and tell them, yes, your assignment is very important. So the tribes of Reuben and Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh come alongside Joshua and they encourage him with their allegiance and their willingness to help. They encourage him by praying for him. They encourage him by taking his assignment and their responsibility with life and death seriousness. And then the fourth and final encouragement to Joshua is found in the last line of verse 18. They say to Joshua, only be strong 
and courageous. They offer to Joshua words of encouragement, words that he's heard before. Remember when Moses sends the spies into the land, when he sends the spies, the 12 spies into the land, he leaves them with the words, be strong and courageous. When Moses turns over the leadership of Israel to Joshua, he says to Joshua, be strong and courageous. In these first 18 verses of the book of Joshua, four times we see the words, be strong and courageous. Three times God says them to Joshua. And right here, the people say to Joshua, be strong and courageous. They recognize that Joshua's assignment is difficult. They recognize that he has a hard task in front of him. So they tell him, we're with you, Joshua. They're praying for him. They recognize the seriousness, and they tell him, Joshua, remember what God said? We're saying the same thing to you. Be strong and be courageous. Now, each one of us have been given assignments. Each one of you have an assignment from God, an assignment that in all likelihood is very difficult. The NAPS assignment in going to Africa is not the only difficult assignment represented in this room. I would suggest that almost every one of us right now has a difficult assignment that God has given to us. Right now, you sitting in this room have a difficult assignment that God has given to you. Assignment that is seemingly overwhelming. An assignment that causes you to be afraid. An assignment that causes you to be anxious. That causes you to be worried. That maybe even causes you to panic and be angry. But God wants you to know that he is with you. He will never leave you or forsake you. And he is bringing people into your life to tell you that you can do it. I started the sermon talking to you and sharing with you the story of Brian and Jen Knapp. And it was last Wednesday when they left and got on a plane and left Grand Rapids for Uganda. But I want you to know that they didn't leave Grand Rapids alone without encouragement. Because last Monday night, the number of friends and family gathered in their almost empty house. Most of the furniture was gone. Friends and family gathered with the Naps to worship the God who gave them the assignment, to pray for them, to wrap arms around them to tell them that they are with them and that God will never leave them nor forsake them. And as I sat in that room, I looked at the 40 or 50 people that were in that room, and I looked around and I saw the demonstration of all four of these types of encouragement. There were people in that room that were there supporting the assignment that God had given to the Naps. There were people there that had supported the assignment through providing financially for Brian and Jen Knapp and their girls to go. I looked at the family in the room that took the dog for the Naps. I looked around the room and I saw people who had been praying for the Naps, who were praying for the Naps that night, and who have committed to pray for the Naps in the future. I looked around that room and everybody in that room recognized the seriousness of the assignment of the tasks that God had given to the Knapp family. There was one point in the evening where I was, I was kind of sitting, I was sitting on the floor and, and I heard a cry and it was the cry of a little girl and I kind of looked over my shoulder and one of the Knapp's daughters, Julie, she was, she's, she's crying and it's obviously, she's obvious, she's overwhelmed and she's anxious about the fact that in just two short days their family is going to get on a plane and leave almost everything they know. And then I saw one of our congregants, one of Calvary's own, Lori Schultze, take Julie in her arms and put her on her lap and wrap her arms around her and hold her and say, you know what? It's going to be okay. God is never going to leave you. God is never going to forsake you. He is with you. And you know what? Julie stopped crying. Everyone in that room recognized the serious nature of their call. And everyone in that room was there wrapping their arms around the Knapp family saying, God has given you this assignment. He's responsible for the outcome. He will never leave you and forsake you. Stay obedient.
because he is going to bless you. He is with you, and he is going to take you from being an aid to being a servant of the Lord. Now, this morning, I want to leave you with two things. I want to leave you with encouragement, and I want to leave you with a mini assignment. The encouragement is this. Right now, I want you to, in your mind, picture the assignment that God has given you. Put the assignment that God has given you in your mind. Dealing with a divorce you didn't ask for, raising a special needs child, dealing with the death of a loved one, starting a neighborhood Bible study, going to a new school, being Jesus to the other members on your team, no matter what the assignment is, put it in your mind. And here's what I want you to know this morning. What I want you to know this morning is it is God who gave you that assignment. As much as I would love to lessen the assignment for you, as much as I would love to lighten the load for you, God has given you that assignment. And he has given you that assignment because he wants you to be obedient so that he can bless you, so that he can show you who he is, so that he can reveal himself in new and exciting ways to you. That is why he has given you the difficult assignment that he has given you. I know it is hard. I know it is difficult. But he gave it to you for your benefit. And not only did he give it to you for your benefit, he gave it to you for your benefit and for the benefit of the people around you. Because he has called you to impact this world for his glory and for his delight. And he has to do that by giving you an assignment. The assignment that you are thinking about, no matter how difficult it is, God gave to you. And not only did God give you the assignment, God is responsible for the outcome. God is going to make it a success. All you have to do is be obedient. Do what he says. Think what he wants you to think. Be obedient to his call and he will bless you and he will move and he will act and he takes care of the outcome. And the final thing is remember, he is always with you. He will never, ever, ever leave you nor forsake you. You are never alone. God wants to bless you. And he wants to bless you and he trusts you so much that he has given you this difficult assignment. I know it's not easy. I know some of them stink. But when Paul says in Romans 8, he works all things together for good to them that love the Lord, that is not a suggestion. It's not a lie. It is the truth. So whatever you are going through, whatever the assignment is, it is for your good. He has given you the assignment. He is responsible for the outcome. And he will never, ever leave you or forsake you. He wants to bless you. Be obedient. And then the final, the final mini assignment. Because we are all in this together, because each one of us at Calvary Church are part of this church family, I am encouraging you to be an encourager. Don't be a discourager. You go find somebody that you can tell God is with you, he is responsible for the outcome, and he will never leave you nor forsake you. Anybody can discourage Anybody can throw water on the fire. Anybody can sit in the background and not do anything. It takes somebody special to step up and speak words of encouragement to people who need to hear words of encouragement. And there are people sitting next to you right now. Every one of us in this room needs some word of encouragement. So, your mini assignment, in addition to the assignment that you already have, is you find somebody who has a difficult assignment. And I can pretty much promise you they're no further than about four or five feet from you. And you tell them, you tell them, God is with you and he's responsible for the outcome and he will never leave you or forsake you because we are all in this together. And God has given us assignments and he wants you to be successful in that assignment. He wants to bless you. Don't be a discourager. Be an encourager.